this week on To the Contrary. First, new insights on women's lack of progress in the workplace. Behind the headlines, interval training as a new parent. And Planned Parenthood's favor with the public rises as congressional conservatives try to kill it. Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, women advancing slowly. It will take 100 years before women achieve true equality in corporate America. That, according to a major new study, which notes that fewer than one in five people in the pipeline to the corporate executive suite is female. And conventional wisdom as to why women aren't progressing may be wrong. Both men and women report similar levels of ambition and conflict between work and family life. Parenthood does not dampen that attitude for either gender. But as time in the workplace grows longer, women are more likely to say they don't want the top executive job. And they report stress and pressure as factors holding them back more often than men do. According to the study, the path to leadership might be more stressful for women because the root issue is gender bias, working at different levels and in complex ways. Almost half of all women say their corporations give women fewer opportunities to advance than men. So Congresswoman Norton, we've talked on this show about the lack of equality for women in the workplace for literally decades, but this uh, this report has some amazing new findings that we've never seen before. Which is your favorite? Well, <clears throat> Bonnie, my favorite is that at, le at every level of management, uh, women are rated more, uh, rated higher than men, uh, but uh, the proportion of men grows the higher the level of management. Tell me that's not discrimination. Well, my favorite was that apparently if you're a man, it helps to be likable. But if you're a woman, it hurts you. Who knew? <laughs> My favorite was that even if you're respected as a woman and you have power as a woman, that others perceive you don't have the power to bring them along with you as your success rises. My favorite was looking at the solutions that the report identified. It talked about targets. And it says, well, the margin uh, to increase the market, but what about the women who are being marginalized? And what are we going to do to get them ahead? Well, and you, as one of two former EEOC chairs we have on the panel today, what does this tell you? I mean, is sexism just so deeply ingrained in our society that it's going to take another revolution to, to, to get rid of it? I, I think we continue to have structural problems or challenges and biases. We continue to have uh, what I consider to be social as well as habitual. You know, some people, you talk about networks. We haven't really integrated networks. Men have their male networks. Women have their female networks. Uh, but we don't have a diverse network. And so when you have men at the top, that's where they, the natural flow. So that's, a, that's sort of but, like but, a habitual but, thing. But let me, t let me take you a step back on that because there have been things like the Internet National Women's Forum mm -hmm. for decades right. now that are all and it's not the only one NABO and and uh, you know women business owners and all these kinds of uh, NAFI the National Association of Female Executives mm -hmm. have they not made any dent in all of this in, in creating you know powerful networks of women so that women can help each other along? I, I think they have. I think that and uh, you have these these organizations are made up of highly accomplished women, but typically they're the the woman uh, in a particular organization. So it's women talking to women as opposed to the question is, well, where do, where do men go? Uh, do they go to a women's group when they recruit? If they want to be intentional, they do. But if, if they just want to recruit someone, they go to a, a, a mainstream type of organization. So we still have a ways to go. And men, why, why you know, if, if you really want to break through this, women ought to be able to go to men. If they're the ones that are in a position to be the mentors, there needs to be greater freedom to go to them and or for them to come to women, particularly when you consider that these women are rarefied mm -hmm. in, in their talent. 
Uh, and these women, in light of what you asked us about the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, are not likely to file a complaint right. with the EEOC. Some because them, it ruins their career. Oh, Jesus, you're black, excuse me, you're black, <laughs> you're black listed uh, if you do that. Uh, so it's very hard for the law to reach this, which, which means that this survey, this very helpful survey, uh, needs to, to, to get the attention of these CEOs who say that they're all for affirmative action and diversity, but their employees perceive no action. But I think there's another problem here. If you looked at the data in that survey, one of the things they showed is that women are not in line positions. Mm -hmm. They are not in positions that uh, contribute to the bottom line of the corporation. But why no, not? it said it said that they started out in but those. But then they go off. But right. either and what I didn't what I didn't find clear in that survey was okay. Do they self-select mm. from a line job where you're okay. guiding a factory into public relations, into human relations, which are non-line jobs, or are they forced into well, them? Well. Sometimes what happens is you get a vice president for diversity, a vice president for you know corporate relations. Those are the kinds of positions, uh, human uh, resources. Those are the kinds of positions where you see more women in corporate America. And so women may, in fact, that you know they say they want promotions. They may want a promotion. That salary looks really good but it's going to end up topping you off. You're not going to be kept, you know, kept in line for a CEO position. So, so that's part of the problem. Um, but also, the, the big thing was that what you described as women feeling more stressed. They, uh, some of the women say they don't want to be CEOs. That's why I don't think it's going to take 100 years. We may never see a time when you're going to have equal numbers of women in these positions. But women are equal. When, uh, when they start, it's the system getting to them that pushes them to that point. When they start out, 75 versus 78 percent, mm -hmm. and ambi the ambition is equal. And quite frankly, conservatives have been saying for quite some time now that women self-select out, that women don't want to necessarily be CEOs. And these data show that that's not true. Well, when they get to the top, they don't necessarily want to. Maybe they find out, gee, this is going but to consume facing... my entire life, and I don't want that. And what's wrong with that? Well, I don't mind what's that. What's different in our country than looking at some of the Nordic countries and look at the rest of the world? We don't have to sit here and gaze at our own navels, to use a, a Bush term. <laughs> um, you know, we can look at other countries where women do rise, where they are there in CEO positions, where they don't opt out. Perhaps those countries support women more in staying in those jobs. Perhaps there are more programs that help with child care. I mean, we can look at other countries and get some guidance. My there. experience in the international business community, and I have some, is that there are fewer women in those positions in those countries. This is Not pretty more. global. This problem is pretty global. I, I, I agree with you that you can take two or three Scandinavian countries where mm -hmm. people tend to rise and benefits, for example, for women may help them in their earlier well, years. Well, and Finland had to turn to quotas, to quotas, to get some, it wasn't 50 percent, but it was like 40 percent women CEOs 40%. of government related corporations, and quotas. Your, right. And your point about a start, women starting off equally ambitious needs to be uh, understood. They, they wouldn't have 40 years ago. Uh, today, and your, we owe this to feminism, they're young and foolish. <laughs> they, they really <laughs> think know. that they're like everybody else. Uh, and then they, then they find out that what we're doing in their generation, and not only their generation, perhaps their millennia, is unraveling the millennia of the way women have been uh, channeled and treated. So they're called upon to make a cosmic jump in order to really view themselves as perfectly equal uh, uh, to men. I mean, I'm in a, con a Congress. Why are there only 17 percent of the House of Representatives? Uh, that says everything to me when these women have leadership positions throughout our society. Uh, and that's reflected in every important level of work uh, in our society well, and throughout the world. Yeah, there's no question that the pipeline to advancement has a big leak in it. It's leaking out very talented. And it, it, only 17 percent women. I, I found that that uh, figure staggering. Right. And the thing is, oftentimes the requirements change. You know, we used to say, well, if you go to a line job, 
that you can get ahead. Now we say, well, you have to have a line job, but you also have to have global experience. So you have to have lived outside of the United States. Last well, short word, Deborah. Oh, short word. Okay. Well, I would say tie yourself to the budget because it shows that women advance uh, further when they are holding the purse strings and can do the promotions and have a lot to do with compensation. All right, and get in early. All these startups, <laughs> be part of it. Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie or Bay. From women and work to Planned Parenthood. Despite conservative Republican attacks and televised congressional hearings to defund, it appears the American public continues to support Planned Parenthood. A nationwide USA Today Suffolk University poll finds Americans back government support for the group by more than two to one. And by almost four to one, Americans told pollsters opponents should not force a government shutdown over this issue. Planned Parenthood President Cecile Richards faced off with GOP House members who grilled her about the organization's budget, her salary, and the controversial videotapes that started this latest battle. Richard says she's proud of her group's work supporting fetal tissue research. She called the secretly recorded, heavily doctored videos of employees discussing the practice are misleading and part of a smear campaign. And by the way, Deborah Carnahan, that, vid that poll that we reported on came out just after she had testified, um, and the numbers were up the support for Planned Parenthood was up over what it had been. Mm -hmm. so. Probably the way she was treated in the hearing mm. had a lot to do with that. So what's next? Um, I think what, what's next is they're going to kick the can down the road till we get to December. Um, and right, well, they've already pretty <laughs> much yeah, done that, right? right? We, we, okay, but Mike, yeah, we what, it, but what happens in December? The problem well, doesn't go away. The problem doesn't go away, and, I, and of course, Eleanor can address this better than I can, <laughs> but, um, you know, the politicians, and in particular the Republican politicians, are going to have to look at these numbers and see if they're willing to shut down the government over defunding Planned Parenthood, because it's going to come up again. Do you think they care? The 28 men who signed the letter well, uh, that brought about Boehner's resignation. One can be opposed to federal funding for Planned Parenthood, as I am, and think that it is a terrible idea to take that position and to shut the government down, uh, which I oppose. So, I mean, I think the, the whole question of funding for Planned Parenthood you know, it, it, it really probably would take the Republicans being in control of both the Senate and the House and a president uh, in the White House uh, who was sympathetic to uh, upholding a bill that defunded Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood would go on and would exist without federal funding. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that Ms. Richards sort of... Five hundred million dollars a year, mainly in Medicare reimbursements, right? Yeah, but, eight, but 86 percent of their... Uh, operating revenue comes from performing abortions, which receives no federal funding. That's funds. just not that, true. That, 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 I served I on the National Board of Planned I Parenthood. I am sorry. I know our budget. I know where our money came from. The bulk of our money came from contraception and contraception sales. So actually, Obamacare and offering free contraception wasn't necessarily good for Planned Parenthood. And no, I, I just want, with, I want that to ask That was the... after taking out all of the federal money. That is what is being reported, and it's reported by CNN. It is a very controversial figure, and if I were you, I wouldn't repeat it. Because but, but wait, let me ask. The, it seems to me, when you see these numbers, and six, seventy-three percent, I think it was seventy-three or seventy-nine percent of the American public doesn't want a government shutdown uh, over this issue, and sixty-five percent support funding, which is a pretty overwhelming majority given the controversy and surrounding this supporting. topic. But wait a second, doesn't it point to? For the, for the extremists in the party to keep fighting this fight, don't they play into the war on women uh, rhetoric, and, don't, and especially with presidential elections coming up next year, don't they continue the view of their opposition to not just abortion, but really birth control? If you took that $500 million and you gave it to community women's health groups that, by the way, perform mammograms when not a single Planned Parenthood uh, oh. Because has the a government mammogram rules machine. force them to outsource it. Of okay, course, nobody. But, all right, but take that money and put it into another. The reason Americans support Planned Parenthood is exactly for what Deborah suggested, for contraception. That is what the support is for, and those services I think ought to be supported, and they ought to be supported. Well, but, but they are supported. Other things. They, they, yeah, they, they are. Well, why do you, you know, why do you think for 99 years 
Planned Parenthood has received this support. It's been doing abortions as, as, as long as they've been legal. It's built its reputation from going where nobody else goes, including our, our, our mm -hmm. centers, which serve the poor, and setting up where they are most needed, in low-income neighborhoods, neighborhoods of color, neighborhoods where there are young women who don't have health insurance. And with that 99-year record, for Republicans to think they can yank that out and that the public has no historic memory is being proved wrong every day. I was in that hearing. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was our committee. The inkling of, of what they might have called it on, they hardly touched, and that is uh, whether they were, were, were selling this fetal tissue. And the reason they didn't touch it is because there's not a single person in the United States who hasn't benefited from what now amounts to two decades of legal contri uh, uh, contributory, all, con all, all, all contributed, use of fetal tissue uh, for virtually every Research. vaccine that, that we now use, from polio to measles. Uh, and now they're finding ways to get at the really hard ones like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, I was just going to say, one, one thing we do know, it, it becomes a, a very tough political issue in the middle of a presidential campaign. And so polls will tell you, will reflect that. I think it's a societal, societal issue, uh, whether it's for stem cell research, whether it's a treatment of, of the fetuses. Uh, so I don't know that we actually have. I mean, I think there's some good things that uh, come out of Planned Parenthood as it relates to some of the services that they provide in contraception. But I also think there's some seriously controversial issues, and I think that's the part that the federal government has to. And we are, we are out of time. I'm <laughs> okay. sorry. Behind the headlines, men as caregivers. Just so happens, Anne Marie Slaughter's new book came out in the same week as that McKinsey study we talked about earlier. Slaughter, you will recall, is the woman who reignited the question, can women have it all? That after leaving the Clinton State Department. Slaughter now says, maybe we need a new lens through which we look at this issue. Her book is called Unfinished Business. I think we're stuck because we are focusing only on women. And although I'm all for promoting women and electing women, I think we are missing the larger piece of this puzzle, which is that we need to revalue care. Uh, and we need to expand choices and roles for men. Anne Marie Slaughter was a rising star in the Clinton State Department. She seemed poised for a possible promotion, but she abruptly left her high power job to return home to Princeton, her family, and an academic career. Her weekly commute between D.C. and New Jersey was affecting her family. One of her sons was getting in trouble. In a 2012 article in The Atlantic magazine, Slaughter used her experience to illustrate why women still couldn't have it all. She questioned whether there was some way she could have stayed at the State Department after many other married women with children had been successful. We can all point to women who can make this work uh, and couples who can make this work. But what I realized was there are far more who hit some kind of a tipping point. For me, it was commuting, but in other cases, it's a divorce, a death, you know, a child with special needs. There are a million reasons why suddenly that con carefully constructed balance tips. And when that happens, our response should not be, oh, I guess she dropped out or she opted out or she sacrificed her career for her family. It was a judgment Slaughter recognized because she had felt the same way about other women in the past. I, I suddenly realized that this narrative I had grown up with, that of course you could fit work and family together if you just wanted it badly enough and tried hard enough, was way too simple. And that actually if a woman like me with every advantage going couldn't make it work, then in fact it was so much harder for most other women or caregivers more broadly, we needed to rethink this. She began by considering why women seeking financial independence and professional success rely on a male model of achievement. 
I grew up wanting to be like my dad because my mother was a homemaker and my father was a lawyer and it was clear to me as somebody who came of age during the women's movement in the 70s that to be valuable and a person of worth you wanted to be like your dad. But I look at my mother's work of not only raising three successful, productive, happy children, uh, but also knitting a wider family together. And I now think th those two bodies of work are equal. Slaughter believes there needs to be one lead parent. While more millennial men are the lead, it's still challenging for many men to put their wives' careers ahead of their own. We have really changed their norms around what is feminine. You know, you can be a woman CEO and like shoes and dress like a woman and not be a mini man. But we still have a very outdated notion of masculinity, and we essentially say if you're not you know, trying to climb the hierarchy, if you're not the big breadwinner, you, your very masculinity is in question. Same-sex couples who make these decisions devoid of gender stereotypes may provide a model for the rest of society. When two men or two women decide, they ask the questions we should all be asking, which is who has, who's making more money? Who has more ambition? Who has the bigger potential career? Who has a better boss? Who, can, who actually wants to be more with the kids? One of Slaughter's suggestions for work-life balance is what she refers to as interval training, a path that looks similar to the so-called mommy or daddy trap. You could say, you know, I'm going hard, I'm in a you know, really intense interval, or you could say, you know, I'm taking some time and I'm focusing on being a lead parent or I'm taking care of my own parents. And then you could go fall hard again. And that again, these are, these, these changes are cultural changes. Slaughter is also interested in equality and fairness for women who are not at the top. She says it's not a problem that should be dealt with individually, one woman at a time. It requires political, corporate, and social action. Balance is a luxury. But equality is a necessity. And one of the reasons I'm focusing on care is because we have too few women at the top, but we have way too many women at the bottom. And that is part of the same devaluing of care. What's happening at the bottom is that women have no choice about being the breadwinner and the caregiver. They're single moms. They are supporting children and other family members. And we are not providing the supports. And that's a much, much bigger social problem than not having enough women in the C-suite. And let's remember all the unmarried mothers out there, you know, who, became, who had children on their own. I mean, they don't even have a partner necessarily to, to be able to help them with this stuff. So what's the way forward? Well, I think the whole question of balance is an important one. And I think we have to remember that for some of us, life is more than about our paycheck or about you know the status that we have or whether or not we get to the top of the ladder. Uh, and having a balance, having a well-rounded life, having a family life, having a personal life is very important. That's one of the reasons I think you know in some ways women are more grounded. When you you know read the uh, Lean In uh, McKinsey study and you find that you know some women are saying that you know gee they don't like the stress, maybe they don't want more stress. Why should we be bemoaning that? Why shouldn't we be saying, yeah, you're right, and we would be all better off as a society if people were not quite, you know, so totally focused on, on careers. You know, in, in, in stressing in, 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 in the age of feminism and equality, that women are entitled to be perceived equally and to equal opportunity, I think many have forgotten the underlying message of feminism, which was choice. It was, we ought to be free to be wherever life leads us. And we haven't been. We have been pigeonholed into a very tiny part of society. But feminism never said, unless you are a career woman, something is wrong with you. And that understanding of the breadth of feminism needs to be incorporated into how we look at what uh, this video tells us. So are you saying women should be less ambitious because the I'm, say, I, I'm saying that women's ambition is what we're promoting without saying that to get out of the cubbyhole we've been put in 
you need to have the same ambition as men. And people who put family first should not be put down in a society where the children are all over the map and where it's very hard to see where many of them are going today. Yeah, and, and I'm pleased to see that this new generation of millennials actually you don't have to be a same-sex couple to talk about, well, you know, who wants to get ahead or where is the opportunity going to be? So they're making this decision together. But my other point was going to be, I talk to so many women who say, I've got so many balls in the air that I'm juggling. She says, my talk about balance, I'm calling it don't let it drop because I just can't get to it. I think balance is not uh, a luxury. I think balance is a necessity to stay healthy. Yeah, but that's to the point. The women are juggling all the balls, and they're up in the air. And I, I like the point that she just made about maybe we need to look at male roles and freeing up male roles, and then we can free up the men. Maybe we can free up ourselves. <laughs> right, and that has been since I was a teenager, probably around the same time she was, that uh, that men would do half the work and therefore less, still some daycare, but less daycare would be needed. That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.